morning. So what is this thing of the world? Perhaps more accurately, we might ask, what is it to be of this world, vice in or into the world? A couple of definitions are in order first. Am I okay, Ed? Okay, right on, brother. The English dictionary defines worldly, i.e. the adjective of being of the world as relating to the human world or ordinary life rather than to religious or spiritual matters. It goes on to say, having a lot of practical experience and knowledge about life and the world. In fact, it is this first definition, human world, by spiritual matter, quite exactly matches John in st- John's intent of the use of the word world. More on that in a moment. Further, and at the unintended expense of getting too ticky-tacky on the use of words like of and in, it is important to point out that of implies belonging to, relating to, or connected with, and in and into simply implies physical location. Truth is that from a biblical perspective, the Bible has a great deal to say about being of this world, and it's not good, at least as measured by God's intent and standards from John's word. So let's take a brief tour of scriptures from the gospel and epistles of John as he describes the world. This list is less than a quarter of the scriptural references to the world. There are a lot of other biblical synonyms for the world, earthly, human way, flesh, those who are perishing, friendship with the world being enmity to God. But this list is more than adequate to make an obvious conclusion. So from our Gospels today and from the epistles, I'm going to read them as if they were one paragraph. Just trust me that we're not losing any of the intent by combining them into one paragraph. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And Jesus said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. If you were of this world, the world will love you as its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, but, but, but for, he who is, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, we speak from the world, and the world listens to them, but we are from God. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And lastly, and he who comes, i.e. the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So this morning, let us explore how we too can be out of this world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bless these words in our understanding, that it would be the words and the understanding that you would have us have, and bring us in a closer relationship with you, so that we too can be out of this world. Amen. It's a mighty task, brothers and sisters, to be out of this world. Just a quick review of our five primary senses, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and feeling, It almost seems that we are optimally designed to be tempted by the world. Further, since this wrestling match we know is nothing but spiritual, it's against the flesh and blood, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of evil. It can make even the most hardy just want to give up and give in and be of the world. Of course, that sense of futility is exactly what Satan wants us to do. But don't dismay, for there is one and only one way and one defense. Before we answer our fundamental question of how to be out of this world, a little 
exegesis is an order, critical interpretation, shall we say. There is a specific reason why I only use the writings of John for our analysis of the world. From the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, the language of the Gospels provides us with no exact or consistent precedent for what the writers meant by the word world although the Greek word cosmos comes pretty close. Therefore, we have to interpret the author's understanding of the word and its intended use. See, at that time, there were differing levels of understandings of the physical world. There was the sphere, as those of Aristotle and the Greeks knew it to be, and then there was the flat disk, upon which the heavens were a dome and under which were the waters of the sea, which is typically more typical of the understanding and intent of the gospel writers. In fact, the original Greek version of the Old Testament does not even use the word cosmos. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, prefer the use of the Greek word ge, G-E, rather than cosmos, but even that's not consistent. So while this talk about the definitions of cosmos and ge and the world, etc., because it matters, it matters when we study scripture, in particular, John's use of the word world. John was very clearly referring to that that was not of God, i.e., what was under the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, Satan. It will not be until the final kingdom is permanently established, at the end of times, does God ultimately delegate his authority to a particular ruler, Jesus Christ. In fact, to be of this world implies that we are of the evil one. So back to our gospel today, John chapter 17. This chapter is referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. It begins with Jesus lifting up his eyes to heaven, just as we saw in our reading today from the psalm. Lifting up eyes to heaven was typical when one prayed in those times. In his high priestly prayer, Jesus is petitioning the Father not only on behalf of his disciples, but in stunning behalf on us. In the beginning of the prayer, Jesus prays for glorification, that the Son will glorify the Father and the Father will glorify the Son. In the middle of the prayer, Jesus prays for his current followers, those you gave me, his disciples, and those at that time who were counted among the followers, that they would be sanctified in truth, for your word is truth. In this manner, he was indeed praying for what would become the Great Commission. And lastly, at the end of the prayer, Jesus looks beyond the first generation of Christians to those who will believe in me through the word that they may all be one. This unity of one has its origin in the unity of the Father and the Son with the express purpose that the world may know that you sent me and love them as you love me. Christ is of the Father and his saving work is for the whole world, not just for the community of initial followers. His final plea of the prayer, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them, then the prayer having ended, Jesus then goes out to the final events of glorification. That's a pretty stunning detail, brothers and sisters, that might easily be missed. Here was the Lord offering his parting shot. A prayer for you and me. Know this, that very seldom does Scripture deal with events yet to come. In fact, Fee and Stewart, in their book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, reminds us that less than 1% of prophecy concerns events yet to come. 99% has already happened. Yet Jesus, as fully prophet, priest, and king, is grasping the gravity and magnitude of the challenge for those who will believe, you and me. So much so, he offers a specific prayer on our behalf. Now let me get this right. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was in the beginning with God, whom all things were made through, who in the beginning was the Word, the only way, truth, and life, that no one comes to the Father except through Him, specifically and directly prayed for you and me, we should be humbled to tears. 
So you want to be out of this world? You want to know how? Put your trust in Christ. Let us recall that in John chapter 13 is re recorded that Jesus gave us a new commandment. What? A new commandment? Yes. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all the people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's what a Christian looks like to the rest of the world. Love one another as the Father loved him. He the Father and he loved us. More than once, Jesus tells us that if we love him, we will abide in his commandments. Abide. Marcia used that word today when she read from the epistle of John. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Abide in me and I in you, says Jesus. What does abide mean? It means to wait to endure without yielding, to bear patiently, to accept and not reject him. The first time we hear this Greek word meaning abide is indeed in the writings of John. As Jesus began to gather his followers, the focus is on the relationship between Jesus and his followers then and now. This relationship is further characterized by love. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love, he says. This new commandment, love is the fruit that comes from the branches connected to the vine, the very vine that we are grafted to in our baptism. Praise God. So what is this new commandment, to love one another? We call in Mark, a scribe asked Jesus, which commandment was the most important in all? And he says, and you shall love the Lord God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, and you shall love your neighbors as yourself. He says there is no greater commandment, note singular, than these. There is no greater commandment. Again, I say singular. He tells us to do two things, love God and love each other as one commandment, just as Jesus and the Father are one. And if we are in Christ, and if Christ is in us, we are one. And if we love one another, then we are one in our brothers and sisters, and the Son and the Father. I.e., if you love me, you will love one another. If you are in me, and I in you, you will love as the Father has loved me, and I the Father. So you want to be out of this world? Then do that. Love one another as he has loved you. Don't love your money. Don't love your physique. Don't love the attention and loftiness your career may garner you. Don't worry about fitting in, because you won't. Don't worry about being cool, because you won't. Don't worry about being skinny and looking like some Victoria's Secret model, for God made you the way he did for a specific purpose. And he loves you and finds you beautiful just the way you are. Recall that in our baptism, we are buried for our sins in Christ. And when we keep on committing a recurring sin, we only re-crucify the Christ and grieve the Holy Spirit. I must confess that being given this opportunity to preach as I have, it's often like being given the opportunity to write a letter to yourself. Ouch. That's like being given in a mirror and getting to see yourself a little bit more like Jesus does. It's not a pretty picture. You get to ask questions like, what is my trash? What is my recurring sin of thought, word, and deed? You know, we say that every Sunday, but do we mean it? Or are we just going through the motions? We are wonderfully adept at seeing the trash in others, right? Right? But if we really love Christ, we'll follow his commandments. And through the power of Christ be done with our earthly idols. Look, we all go through spiritual highs and lows. Sometimes it's the product of God just pulling back a bit. And for us to be given the chance to chase him, to maybe get back into the word, that's exactly what the wise person does. Other times it's the product of grieving the Holy Spirit, which will indeed retract, 
with recurring sins. Like I said, I must confess, I've been going through a personal spiritual low for some time. My daughter shared with me the other day that she's been going through the same as well. Only each person can know why. But we all know why. For we have all been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, so we know exactly why when we feel distant from God. The question is, are we willing to be honest with ourselves and God? My reason is grieving the Holy Spirit. Now, the specifics of my struggles are between God and me. But I'm not afraid to admit that I have them, even from the front of the church. Because the fear of the Lord I have is much greater than the fear of admitting that I have recurring trash. The book of Hebrews says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But that fear that I have is a byproduct of not having perfect love, just like what Marcia read for us this morning. And not a one of us in this room is exempt from the hand of God. Even as I worked on this very message, on loving the Lord God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, the amount of garbage that I entertained in my mind with the idols that I hold on this earth was unbelievable. We're Protestants, right? Just like Pastor Tony has reminded us. We do not have to confess to a person, but we do have to confess to the Lord. Only through genuine repentance, that heartfelt desire of being remorseful and wanting to permanently return, permanently turn from that sin, can we, bear, can we be guaranteed God's life-giving grace? Hate what God hates, right? And if we do that, if we follow his commandments, i.e. generally love him and not this world, he'll give us a way out. We'll never be clear of temptation, at least not as long as we're stuck in this broken flesh and bones. But he promised us his protection. And if you stumble, which we will, <laughs> he'll still be there waiting to pick up the broken pieces and restrengthen you in him. So brothers and sisters, let's be permanently done through the power of Jesus Christ or failing to love Christ as he loved us and not following his commandment in perfect love. Yeah, I'm in this world but I don't have to be of it. When I consciously entertain the world, I am not following his commandments. So what's the operative ver verb for us today? Love. Love him as he loved the Father. Love the Lord God. Abide in me and I in you, says Jesus Christ. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of possessions is not from the Father, but from the world. And this world is passing away, along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Jesus is out of this world, so let us respond in kind. Until that glorious day when that trumpet sounds, the voice of the archangel exclaims, when those who are alive who are left will be caught up in the air with those who sleep, with he who is indeed out of this world. In Christ's name, amen.